All right, welcome back to the channel. Today we're gonna to be discussing all this controversy that's been going on with Red Hat. I've seen a lot of really stupid takes come up on some of these Reddit boards. Fortunately, I have seen some people put out some pretty good info. I wanna give a shout out to Jay over at Learn Linux TV. He did a video here talking about why corporate owned Linux distributions are a bad idea. And to be fair to him, he did a good breakdown, and there, there's some other stuff that I want to cover because I think a lot of people don't really truly understand a lot of what's really been going on with Red Hat and IBM, and there's some financial stuff that I'm not hearing people talk about. And you know the Linux community just loves drama, so let's stir some drama up. Some people might think that I'm a, a Red Hat apologist or that I'm defending them. I don't agree with the actions that they've been taking as of late, but there needs to be a more balanced view here. And the fact of the matter is, is that you can't get blinded by one side or the other. You need to take a look at both sides of the argument and come to a proper conclusion. And you know, I've got to give a shout out to Red Hat and give some credit where credit is due because I got my start in Linux from Red Hat. Uh, going back to, uh, it was about Red Hat 5, it released back in the 90s, this was before it became Enterprise Linux. That was my first ever exposure to uh, Linux in general, was using the uh, old school Red Hat. And I don't know if I would have ever been where I made it today in the IT world had it not been for all of my time being exposed to things like Red Hat, to Linux in general, to things like FreeBSD. Now, there was a statement put out by Mike McGrath. He's one of the VPs over at Red Hat. And there's a couple of paragraphs in this statement that we're gonna take a look at. I'll drop a link to it down below if you wanna go check out the full statement that he made. There's a couple things in particular that we're gonna talk about today. But before we do that, let's take a look at something that's really relevant here, which is the, the status of IBM and Red Hat and some of the financials, because I haven't seen anyone in the community so far talk about this aspect of it. If you gloss this over, you're missing a lot of the context that has led up to some of the decisions that are being made today. So the first thing that we're going to take a look at here today is going to be some financials and the public history of these companies. Now, let's take a look at Red Hat first. For those that are unaware, Red Hat used to be a publicly traded company. That was before IBM ended up buying them. Uh, they went on the stock market around 1999 up until 2019, which is when the merger completed between IBM and Red Hat. And let's pay attention to the financials here because this is a really important aspect that a lot of people have missed. We're gonna take a look at Red Hat, we're gonna take a look at IBM, and we're also gonna take a look at another software company. So when they got on the stock market, you can see their share price was something around $64 per share. This was in 1999. And then you can see this huge dump here. This was the uh, mostly related to the dot-com crash, but you can see they were on a very steady climb up and there was a very sharp increase seemingly overnight. And there's a, this is important to pay attention to right here because we're gonna come back to this in just a minute. Now, a lot of the people that I've seen on like the Reddit, for, or Reddit threads making stupid comments talking about Red Hat, I don't necessarily, and this is an opinion on my part, this isn't, anything that I can prove. It seemed like a lot of this stupidity started happening after IBM took over Red Hat. And the general consensus from a lot of people in the, the community, the Linux community, the ones that pay attention, seems to be the same thing, that IBM is the one that's really responsible for a lot of these stupid decisions. And not, not particularly that a lot of us believe that it's coming from Red Hat themselves, that rather that they're getting their marching orders from their parent company. So. We're gonna come back to this here in a second because this is important. Now let's take a look at IBM stock. Now you can see here, if you go back to 1983, back when uh, we have data on what they were trading at. So you can see here, they were trading at 28.68 uh, US dollars. Now you have to adjust for inflation on this to get a better look because if you look at this, it looks like, whoa, this is, 
you know, they've added some pretty decent value. But if you take a look at the overall picture and adjust for inflation, this 2860 was actually $87.57 if you adjust that for today's uh, rate. So when you consider it from that aspect, this all of a sudden becomes much less impressive because IBM, here's something important to consider. And a lot of people have talked about this. I've seen this in some Reddit threads. I've not seen it in a lot. But I've seen this in some Reddit threads talking about how IBM in general is really, I mean, it's unbelievable that a publicly traded tech company since 1983 has only managed to increase 363% of their market value. You would think that being such a big tech company that they could have came up with ways to massively increase that it, like I said especially when you consider this from the aspect that like I said this is a publicly traded company and for those that are let me also address the publicly traded company part of it because some people might ask well why would you ever trade publicly uh, you know there might be a lot of people in the enthusiast community that have never been exposed to a corporate environment well really one of the biggest reasons that you take a company public is because you can all of a sudden leverage other people's money it's the aspect of basically you're getting free money because once it gets put on the stock market, all of a sudden you're going to get this huge infusion of money that you didn't have before. It's really the reason that a lot of these biggest companies in the world today, like the Fortune 500s, some of the biggest companies in the world are publicly traded. It, when, to get to a massive, massive company and to be private, it takes a whole hell of a lot more time and effort to be able to do that than it does for a company that's publicly traded. You know, take a look at other things like Uber or Airbnb. You know, that's uh, another perfect example. When you go public, all of a sudden people can infuse a bunch of money into it that you're not having to build, the, the company founder, let's say, isn't having to build that up through a more tedious process like building client base and all that. It all of a sudden just floods in. And so there's, there's a big downside to that, and we're going to cover that here in just a minute. But you can see, you know, Red Hat has done pretty damn well for themselves. And we're going to cover some more on that in just a second. But let's take a look at another software company, Microsoft. Now, when you take a look at what they've done, so they started, you go back to 1986 when their publicly, their, their, uh, each share of Microsoft went for 10 cents. Okay, and look at right now what they're trading at today is $331 and change. So you've got a 331,730% change. Now take a look at IBM stock, which is 363% change. And these guys were on the, you know, this this data goes back further. This goes back to 1983 as, as opposed to 1986. You know, this is what a big tech company should look like. And, you know, if you go back and look through some of IBM's history, there was one of the one of the execs there. Uh, that this kind of went down as an infamous quote in in their history was that well, we don't really see the value of personal computers. It was something to the effect of we don't see that there's going to be personal computers in everybody's home. And look how ridiculous of a statement that was. If they would have prepared themselves for that and been ready, they could have taken a whole hell of a lot of market share, whereas, you know, Apple and Microsoft came in and just completely destroyed uh, what IBM could have done, what they could have become. And, you know, there's, when you take a look here, so if you, let's take a look at 1999. Okay, so they're trading close to $120 per share. And we're sitting here at 2023 at $132 per share. Now, I didn't run the inflation numbers, but I'm, I'm guessing that $119 back in 1999 is worth more than 132 is worth these days. So basically this company's been stagnant. Okay, and the, and the, the adoption rate, the growth of the electronics market has done, done nothing but grow and grow. And so it just, it's unbelievable to me that a huge, tech company like IBM hasn't figured out a way to massively grow their company, whereas you take something like Microsoft, Intel, AMD, Apple, all these other companies, and they have just, they've been able to skyrocket. So again, this is pure opinion. I, I don't necessarily want to 
have IBM come and, and spank my butt with their lawyers or whatnot, but I think that really speaks to the level of the leadership of that company that they just can't seem to figure this stuff out. Okay, so now that we've got that in mind, let's take a look at something else important because I've basically seen almost nobody in, in the community. I think I saw like maybe one or two people on, on some of these Reddit threads talk about this, but all these other people just gloss over this. They either don't know about this stuff or it's just uh, something that they don't want to bring up. Take a look here at October 26, 2018. Red Hat was trading at 117 and change per share. Now, the news of IBM acquiring Red Hat broke on the 28th. That was a Sunday. You can go back and take a look at this and verify for yourself. There were a ton of articles that started coming out talking about the $34 billion acquisition between Microsoft and Red Hat. So, all of a sudden, the share, share price jumps to $174 and change the next day. This was uh, opening on Monday. Now, for those who are not familiar with how public companies work, this is this is the downside of it. And you could go read the, the biography on Steve Jobs if you don't want to. You could go watch the movie. The It's pretty dramatized, but the Ashton Kutcher played uh, Steve Jobs in, in a movie that he did a while back. And, you know, that would kind of give you an interpretation of what happens um, through watching a movie. But when you take a private company public, you know, you get the, the benefit of having all this, this cash infusion, all this money comes rushing in, all this other people's money. The problem is, is then you have to play by different rules. You know, the same thing happened to Steve Jobs where he started that company, he built that company, him and and a lot of people would say Steve Wozniak. Steve was basically the brains behind it. Jobs was the, the marketer. He was the guy that built that company up in, in the public's eye. But Steve got fired from his own company. And that's the devil of taking a, a company public is that you have to play by a different set of rules. And if the shareholders, the, the board of directors wants you gone, they could come in, run a vote and you know throw you out and replace you with somebody else. And so here's the issue that I haven't seen many people talk about. So IBM made an offer to Red Hat to purchase their company for $34 billion. It worked out to about $190 per share. Okay, so here at October 26, it was trading for $117 per share. Now the board of directors, the, the people that run these public companies, they have something called a fiduciary duty to the shareholders. So in this case, when a when a when another company is coming in and they're saying, "Hey, we're going to buy out your shares," and they they throw out an offer like that, "Hey, we're going to offer you way more for we're going to pay you way more per share than what you're trading at right now," basically, you know, throw a ton of money at a company. It would violate fiduciary duty for uh, the people. It would have violated the duty at the for the people at Red Hat to have not. Uh, basically taken the offer or at least considered it. And the, like I said, the people that have never worked and don't really have any exposure to the corporate structure, they, 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 don't, they either don't know about this stuff or they overlook it. But that's a very important fact to consider. IBM as a company really had no choice because they had shareholders that they had a responsibility to. And that's basically what pushed this acquisition through was, hey, we're offering you way more money than what you're trading right now per share, so $190 per share when, you know, at this time, granted there was, the price had been fluctuating, but at the time this, right before this acquisition was announced, it traded 117, and then all, you can see all of a sudden, next day it jumps to 174, right after the news broke about IBM and the, the merger acquisition. That's something important to consider. I see some people, I've seen some people on like Reddit threads and whatnot, try and, and throw shade at Red Hat, but it's like, well, they're a public, publicly traded company. They have to play by different rules. You know, you have to put that into consideration because if the CEO and, and the board of directors and all those people would have just ignored the offer or, or dismissed it, it would have became public at some point and then the shareholders could have came along and sued the shit out of the executives and destroyed their lives because hey, we could have got a huge return on our money and you decided not to take the offer. 
Okay, it's, it's one of those evils of being a publicly traded company. So all the people that threw shade at the, the Red Hat executives over that, it's, a lot of that is unfounded, you know? And, and the other thing, so let's, so now that we've talked about that, we can move off of this, this topic here. There's one more thing I'm gonna talk about real quick. Okay, there's this news article I'll drop down in the description talking about how Red Hat's hot streak continues for IBM. You can go read the article yourself, but Red Hat is what's doing really well for IBM. It, you know, again, taking a look back here at their, this uh, chart here, IBM is, I'm, I really don't want this to happen. I really hope IBM doesn't run Red Hat in the ground because uh, this, this company can't seem to figure this shit out. When you're a mega tech company, how have you not been able to grow at a way better rate than 363% per share since 1983. I just, I don't understand this for a tech company. And there, and like I said, there's other people that share this opinion that, you know, when you have companies like Microsoft and Intel and all these other tech startups that are able to just rock it ahead, you're doing something wrong. Okay, that's a sign that you need to look and look at what you're doing and figure out what it is that you're not getting right. Because that that's a piss poor level of growth. And, now let's take a look at what's been going on. So I'm not going to go into the whole Linux drama, but there's a couple paragraphs to, that I want to take a look at on this statement that was put out by Mike from, uh, from Red Hat. This first one here is, I feel that much of the anger from our recent decision around the downstream sources comes from either those who do not want to pay for the time, effort, and resources going into RHEL, or those who want to repackage it for their own profit. This demand for rel code is disingenuous. We're gonna read through one more and there's a couple points to make here. We have to pay the people to do that work. Those passionate contributors grinding through those long hours and nights who believe in open source values. Simply repackaging the code that these individuals produce and reselling it as is with no value added makes the production of this open source software unsustainable. That includes backporting work and future features and technology under development upstream. If that work becomes unsustainable, it will stop and that's not good for anyone. And then he goes into some stuff here talking about CentOS. Now the guy's right, and here's something that people need to consider who just are attacking Red Hat nonstop. And, I, and I'm gonna cover, I'm gonna play devil's advocate here in a minute, so before you go type something stupid down in the comment section, hang in there. Red Hat right now employs about 19,000 people all over the world. And again, I'm gonna give a shout out to Jay over at Learn Linux TV because he mentioned this in his video. He, he mentioned it briefly. He didn't go into as much detail that I'm going to. The Red Hat has done a lot of good things for the open source community in general, not just Linux, but the open source community in general. They have brought so much time, money, and attention to the, the open source community in general. And you've got to look at this more from, more than just the aspect that they employ 19,000 people just at their company and they've managed to uh, have a lot of corporate clients on board and all of these uh, open source developers and engineers and admins that in their free time, you know, if you're gonna work on Linux, people in Linux community tend to be pretty damn passionate. I think that's pretty safe to say. But to have, so you have to consider more than just those 19,000 employees. Take all of the government, uh, all of the government employees, the government contractors, all the private sector employees who work outside of Red Hat and take a look at things like, you know, their, their, their certificate process is, is pretty legitimate. You know, you could get something like Linux Plus from CompTIA. I don't think that's widely regarded as being all that great of a certificate in the IT community, whereas you take something like RHCSA or RHCE, where you have to go through a hands-on lab and you have to demonstrate some real-world experience. You have to go, uh, you could look up, I'm not gonna go into deep detail, but basically take a system that's like broken, fix things, stuff like that. Their, their certification process is a hell of a lot better than just, okay, we're, here's 70 questions, answer all these questions, memorize this, the something out of a book, and then you forget or you never need like 90% of what you went through. Okay, so just from that aspect is you have all of these 
people all around the world that have went and got these certifications. And it's opened up opportunities for them. It opens up opportunities for employers because then employers take a look at, you know, and the certificate thing is just one example of it. But, you know, an employer takes a look at a resume and they see that someone's RH got their RHCE. This is a pretty damn good amount. You know, you could go take a look at uh, like a study guide and then, you know, go through the, the actual certification process. You're gonna come out way better than if you'd go just take some crappy run-of-the-mill test that expects you to memorize a few commands or memorize some goofy knowledge that you're never gonna need or use again. Okay, so you've got that aspect of it. You've got all the attention that's been brought to it. So all these people that come, come and go from the Red Hat uh, community, and, but then they go on and continue work and in the open source community, they go and start developing for other distributions, all this other stuff. Red Hat has done a ton for the community and all of these people that are throwing shade at them, again, go back to what I was saying about the publicly traded company. The executives there couldn't just ignore the offer that IBM put out because they would have had their lives destroyed in court if they would have done that. Again, it's one of the, the evils of being a publicly traded company is shit like that can happen. And you know, it runs the risk of a crappy, mediocre company like IBM coming in and screwing up something great like Red Hat. Now, the other thing I'm gonna mention here is they, they talk about CentOS. And I'm not gonna get into the whole CentOS drama, but something to keep in mind, CentOS released back in 2004. And it seems interesting to me that for years and years, CentOS existed downstream from RHEL, and it seemed like this, this great uh, community, things were going great, and then about a year after IBM acquires Red Hat, all of a sudden then it moves to CentOS stream, then it goes upstream. The timing of that was very suspicious to say the least, if I had to guess. They probably got their marching orders from IBM because IBM, again, you know, you go buy a great company like Red Hat and then you've got a crappy, mediocre company like IBM that just can't figure this tech shit out and figure out how to really grow this company. And oh, uh, let's, let's make some stupid decisions. Let's close down CentOS. So that caused a huge backlash in the community. And now we're coming up on uh, what's really been going on. So I'm gonna read this next part and then I'm gonna make some more points here. And like I said, I'm gonna play devil's advocate against Red Hat. So this, this last paragraph I'm gonna read here. The generally accepted position that these free rebuilds are just funnels turning out real experts and turning sales and turning into sales just isn't reality. I wish we lived in that world, but that's not how it actually plays out. Instead, we found a group of users, many of whom belong to large or very large IT organizations, they want the stability, life cycle, and hardware ecosystem of RHEL without having to actually support the maintainers, engineers, writers, and many more roles that create it. These users have decided not to use one of the many other Linux distributions. Now, a couple things to talk about here. First off, this probably wouldn't have ever happened if this dumbass decision to get rid of CentOS as everyone knew it, to take it upstream instead of being downstream. That was an absolutely horrid decision. And then what happened from that? Then what you had, what had happened from that was you had a couple of offshoots. Uh, Rocky and Alma came out, I think it was back around mid or late 2021. Basically the stuff with CentOS happened and then these two companies come in and uh, come out with basically binary compatible RHEL. So then, what you moved into, and I didn't realize this, I, I had heard of Rocky and Alma, I never really looked into them. You know, one of the issues that I see with the, the Red Hat community, is, or not the Red Hat, the Linux community, is, is all of this fragmentation is absolutely ridiculous. And I'm gonna give a shout out to Chris Titus Tech, he made a video about this just a day or two ago, talking about how most of these distros are pointless. And you know, some of the, the Linux community goes, says, well, choice is a good thing. Well there's something like 320, 330 distros right now that are out there floating around. I mean, that's absolutely stupid. Yes, there's there's the great ones. There's um, Arch, there's Debian. My personal favorites have, have basically always been OpenSUSE and Fedora. 
But there's so many ridiculous, you know, uh, a Windows user that wants to come over to, to Linux, if they go and ask something in a Reddit thread or, or some tech forum, oh, I want to switch over to Linux. Oh, you need to switch to Manjaro. No, you need to switch to Pop! OS. No, you need to switch to Elementary. No, you need to use Linux, L Linux Mint. How the hell do you think that creates uh, an inviting atmosphere that tries to pull users in when there's so much fragmentation, you've got all this community that is so, so like I said, the Linux community loves drama. They're very, I've, I've been in some very, looked at some very combative threads of people that just piss and moan back and forth with each other. It's ridiculous. But going back to the topic of Red Hat here. So Alma and Rocky started basically because of all the stuff with Red Hat. They wanted to basically give a an alternative to what CentOS used to be. Here's the problem with that, and I didn't realize this until I started, look, started looking into all of this Red Hat drama, was that Rocky and Alma started offering support contracts. Now for, again, for those of you that have never worked in a business or a, a government or corporate environment, that's kind of a, a big deal. And I get where Red Hat is coming out with some of this. I don't agree with the decision that they've made here. Well, we'll get into that in a minute. But Red Hat has grown as a company because they've taken something like Linux, but they offer support contracts. And when you have a company of 20,000 people, they've got all these clients, it's, it's worked out great for the clients because they get a rock salt distribution. If a bug or something weird happens, a companies, you know, like I said, they've got these support contracts. So then these, these companies can call up and say, hey, we've got this issue that's going on with uh, our system. And so these companies can call Red Hat. They can have engineers around the clock, 24 seven. Okay, you got this issue. We're gonna, we're gonna push out this update real quick. They'll fix stuff. Red, like I said, Red Hat has done a lot for the Linux community. And a lot of people have really been just glossing over this. Now, let me play devil's advocate here and point out the other side. And one other thing I'm gonna mention real quick. So that's how they make their money. Now, for another company to basically just take what CentOS used to be. They, they're basically taking, like this guy said, they're taking Red Hat's work, so Rocky and Alma. I, if I had to guess, I would say it wasn't necessarily that was so much of the problem as it was that these companies were offering support contracts. So you're taking Red Hat's work and then you're taking support contracts on top of that and you're getting paid for it. Now that to me is a, a kind of a shitbag move. That shouldn't have happened. And, and I'm, I'm a, I agree 100% with uh, Mike's statement on this that, that was ver that's very disingenuous to do that. You're going to benefit off of the work that another company has done for decades now. And thousands of people have put a lot of work into this and then you're just gonna start up a company and oh, we offer support contracts now and we're gonna benefit off of the, the work that this company has done. I, I would have to agree, I, I've, if I was the Red Hat uh, execs, I'd be a little pissed off about that. That's, that's some pretty low effort shit. Now, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. I don't agree with Red Hat's decision to do this because Red Hat, become, Red Hat became who they were, they became great because of the underlying premise. This was open source software. Linux, you know, it's, it's open source code, it's out there for everybody to be able to use. And the fact of the matter is, is that the best product will always win in the end. So let's take Rocky, for example, you know, they're, 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 with them offering support contracts, you have to take, and we'll talk about some freeloading stuff here in a second, but take a large organization that takes this stuff seriously and they go get a support contract and they're looking at companies to provide that, whether it be like Red Hat or Rocky. Now, anyone that takes it seriously and especially for things like critical infrastructure or government agency, you need to use something that has, that's got that 24 seven coverage backed by support to go fix bugs as they come up. Because if a system goes offline in a big corporation, let's say a Fortune 500, some system goes down, that can be millions of dollars per minute that's lost. That's a pretty big deal. And when you talk about things like government agencies, for example, and the government does use RHEL, if a bug comes up or there's some sort of an issue, that could put national security at risk. Again, it's very important that you have a solid 
dedicated group of people that know what the hell they're doing that can go fix that stuff. So then when you take a look at a company like Rocky, it's like, well, how are they going to provide that? So you have a group of people that take, basically took and copied the work of someone else, and now they're gonna go offer support contracts. There's no way you can tell me that that company is gonna be able to offer the same level, the same standard of work that someone like Red Hat can offer. And I haven't done any digging in to see what the contract prices are. Presumably Rocky and Alma support contracts are probably somewhat cheaper than Red Hat. Now, so like I said, the, the, best, the best product, the best service, if you treat your customers right, it's gonna win out in the end. And one of the things that they've talked about is basically people freeloading off of their work. Now here's another thing, and this is the other reason I don't dis that I don't agree with Red Hat's decision to do what they've done, is freeloaders are always going to be freeloaders. You know, if you were to pay for a product or service, the more you pay, the, the more, the more you tend to get out of it. You know, take like freeloaders, you know, go, the, the people watching this are probably IT minded and they want to do like some sort of IT work. Okay, if you go take a look at like YouTube videos that have like IT courses and people do like full IT courses for free, I'm guessing that if you looked at the watch time of a lot of those, the people go in there, they watch like three minutes and then they dip out. Okay, this is people that don't take this shit seriously. The freeloaders are not, if someone doesn't intend to pay for something, they're not gonna pay for it. Like I said, this was, it, all of this I think stems back to the, the decision with CentOS and why it was so stupid for uh, Red Hat to move and, and do what they did with CentOS because I don't think the stuff with Rocky and Elma would have ever even happened had CentOS stayed in place the way that it was and just been downstream. Before people in the community go and, and get all worked up and, and butt hurt and, and constantly attack Red Hat, I, this is again my opinion, I don't think the decisions are so much coming from Red Hat, I think what they're coming from is IBM because IBM is a tech company. Apparently they just can't get something figured out over there. I don't know what the deal is with Red Hat and why they can't figure out how to make a tech company just explode in growth. Because Red Hat was doing just fine, and if you take a look, like I said, at this article here, Red Hat is the one that's performing well for IBM right now. And like I said, I hope that, that IBM doesn't run Red Hat in the ground. I guess we'll, only time will tell. But if they're gonna keep doing stupid decisions like this, and there are some other stuff pointed out here like in the, the article here talking about how IBM pledged to respect Red Hat's neutrality by not interfering with its open source model. Here's, here's one other thing I'm gonna point out. By not interfering with its open source model and to allow Red Hat to sell services to IBM's competitors. Something that Jay over at Learn Linux TV brought up and it was a very good point in this video on why corporate owned Linux distributions are bad ideas is trust. Uh, Talk, he was talking about trust and basically in the business community. So does when you go back to this, when you read this here that IBM pledged to respect net, Red Hat's net neutrality by not interfering with its open source model, is that the message that you get when Red Hat, like I said, I think this came from IBM, but when Red Hat went and decided to kill off CentOS? And then the decision that they've made now in respect to uh, other distros like Rocky and Alma. Th that to me doesn't seem like people holding up to what they said. And Jay brought up a good point that this is basically violating the trust and the respect that people had for Red Hat as a company. And Red Hat as a company is getting their reputation tainted because of a crappy parent company. So, like I said, I hope this doesn't destroy Red Hat, but these these decisions are absolutely stupid. I'm going to continue to use Fedora and OpenSUSE. Hopefully OpenSUSE doesn't get mired in any controversy. But one other thing I'm going to mention here real quick. There is this red, uh, thread here on the Fedora Reddit talking about has all of this drama caused you to feel any differently about Fedora. Okay, so you had a pretty decent amount of people that are still looking at using different options. Only less than half, if you take the total votes, let's get rid of these. So basically about half said they're gonna stick with it and 245. And there's enough people here that said, yes, I'm already in the process of moving 
or have already moved to another distro. First of all, a couple of things I wanna mention on this. Fedora's move, they announced something really stupid recently, which is that they are going to move to uh, opt-out telemetry. Now that telemetry should never be something inside of a uh, Linux distribution. I think that is absolutely stupid. You know, I could get maybe understanding like in Red Hat's case where you'd want to use it and your your clientele are corporate and you need to use that to collect data about how people use it, but to do opt-out telemetry on something like Fedora is stupid. And I've seen some people in, in threads talking about they're trying to play these mental gymnastics saying things like, oh, well, uh, it's not actually sending any telemetry right now. And, and I've seen some comments talking about how that only affects like a local, and then you have to enable some other options in order for it to do telemetry. That's not the point. The point is, if you give someone an inch, they're gonna take a mile because what it's gonna turn into a year from now is it's gonna end up turning into, oh, well now we're gonna turn into something like Microsoft and we're gonna collect all this telemetry about how you use your system and what you're doing on it and all that kind of stuff. Okay, I don't agree with that. And because of the piss poor decision from Red Hat, this is a pretty decent amount of number of people that are either considering or have already jumped off to another distro because Fedora plays a huge part in the community. Like I said, it's hands down one of my favorite operating, uh, operating systems, one of my favorite distributions. And now Red Hat, by doing what they've done and because Fedora is associated with them, now it's caused a lot of damage to Fedora's, their reputation, despite the fact that like it's a community driven and it's upstream from RHEL. This affects them and this affects the Linux community. Anyway, that's my take on all the drama. If, if what I said pissed you off, go ahead and leave a hate comment down below, drop a dislike, I don't really give a shit. If your butt hurt, come out of the shadows, let me know that your butt hurt about what I said and I'll see you in the next one.